All right. So we have an amazing guest spotlight today. Today's guest spotlight is sports writer and author Jeff Perlman. Jeff, welcome to the show. We have a legitimate superstar celebrity. <laughs> Where? Where is he? <laughs> welcome. Right. Welcome, welcome to the show. Friend. Let me introduce oh. our audience to you. Okay. Jeff is a New York Times bestselling author of nine books. He's a former Sports Illustrated senior writer and ESPN.com columnist. He also co-hosts the Two Writers Flinging Yang podcast. His books include biographies of Walter Payton, Brett Favre, Barry Bonds, and Roger Clemens, as well as profiles on the 86 Mets, the 90s Cowboys, the 80s Lakers, and his most recent title, Three Ring Circus, Kobe Shaq film, The Crazy Years of the Lakers Dynasty, was just released in September and is now available on Amazon.com. Jeff? The number one sports book on Amazon right now. The number one sports book on Amazon right now. Thank Get you it. so much for joining us, Jeff. Kudos. It's like having my mother brag about me hearing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't forget my mom would be like, my Jewish mom would be like, don't forget to tell them it's the number one book in sports on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just, you know, we're clear for the audience jeff and i go way back so i got my start as an intern and then a reporter journalist at sports illustrated and jeff was already there as a senior writer at sports illustrated um when i started back in the summer of 1998. so we have known each other for a very long time he is a very dear friend to me he actually gives me comments when i don't even want to comment nicely about myself so we've been through a lot of um interesting conversations together, interesting perspectives, covered a lot of stories together. So it is a pleasure to have him here. I do want to say, can I say one thing? I'm surprised. I can't call you Elizabeth. I always call you Newman. That you didn't introduce <laughs> me as my past life, which is there's this there's this picture of me. It's if you Google it's not I think it's probably the number one picture that comes up. There was after I wrote this story about this baseball player, John Rocker, and it's me wearing a backwards candle <laughs> hat. And I look like okay. it's from like nineteen ninety nine. 2000 so i look like the drummer for pearl jam or like you know a, a failed failed mediocre hip-hop artist from the era so uh, i thought that would come listen up. they used that picture they used that picture in jet magazine okay oh yeah and he, that was awesome he was kind of passing for biracial in that picture <laughs> yeah i wasn't jet bucket list you know <laughs> all right so i know you're friends with elizabeth with lizzie sorry our lizzie uh, Newman, Newman. Now feel free Newman. to tell us a little bit more about yourself, but also an audience would definitely love to hear any juicy, salacious stories you have about working with uh, our wonderful Lizzie. I have a great one. So I'm going to bring it up and talk about it. <laughs> I was doing a story. I was doing a story for Sports Illustrated. I was a baseball writer mainly, but they had me do an Allen Iverson story. And I went to Philly and they sent me there and they sent Newman um kind of after me last minute to help me with the reporting because it was a tough story and iverson was being difficult and for some reason philly all the hotel rooms were booked and there was so i had a room and we were going to share a room and i was like i i was either married at the time or you know whatever dating my wife now and i was like innocently which you obviously know i was like well, we can just share the bed what's the big deal you know you put some pillows down the middle and she's like no you can't you can't share a bed <laughs> right hell no <laughs> and I was I was actually making a very moralistic point, like, what's the big deal? Obviously, nothing's going to happen. It's not like that, blah, 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 blah. So then I think you actually said, you might have said, call your wife and see what she thinks. Now, you weren't saying call your wife to, to come up with the answer. You were just like, watch what happens when you call your wife and ask her. So I call my wife, who's as trusting and open-minded as there is, and like, would never, wasn't like thinking like, oh, he's Chino. And she's like, no, no, no woman would ever be like, yeah, I'll just share a bed with a guy. So... We didn't share the bed. We didn't share the bed. But that's how tight we are. That's how tight we are. You know. We could have shared the bed. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. No, I mean, we... good to have a friendship like that. I mean, it, it's no, it's no, hard to find those male female friendships like that. So, awesome. <laughs> yeah, she's one of the best. I'll tell you something. I'm being serious. One of the best people I ever worked with. One of the most talented people I've ever worked with. And what I have always said to her 
and I've said to a million people, she writes these things on Facebook. There are very few people. I'm an argumentative New Yorker. My wife's an argumentative New Yorker. There are very few people I know who, when they write stuff, especially when she replies to something I wrote that she disagrees with, where at the end of it, I'm like, oh, damn it. I know you start agreeing with her, right? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, she won again. And she's, she would have been, she could have been an amazing columnist if she wanted to pursue that path because she's really argumentative and really persuasive in her argument. She's persuasive. So, yeah. 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 Very talented. I agree. We're, we're lucky. We're, we're blessed to have her. So. Yeah, right, you so definitely are. I was listening to your book on Audible and I love your writing style. I, I see why you're like, a best-selling writer. It's because you're, you're about storytelling. And, and when I was listening, I often felt like I was there, you know, like a voyeur, you know, watching what was going on behind the scenes. I don't want to give anything away, but you throw us right into the fight at the start of the book. So, yeah. you know, and you pull no punches when you critique people, which is, you know, that's, that's, that's really good. So, and you made me laugh a lot. So I, can you tell a, viewers a little bit more about the book, uh, Three Ring Circus? So it's a, uh, it's basically chronicles of 96 to 04 Lakers. So the arrival of Shaq and Kobe until Shaq was traded to Miami and Phil Jackson wasn't brought back. And, uh, it's actually my second Laker book. It's the only time I've ever doubled up on a topic. I did a book about the Magic Johnson era called Showtime. And- um, Showtime, Showtime. <laughs> I was on a podcast Michael Cooper hosted. And he said to me, he goes, I have one complaint about this book. Why is AC Green on the cover, not me? Like, and if you look at the cover, <laughs> well, I gotta look at it again. it's a very fair argument. I was like, I don't even, there's no argument for that one. You're actually right. Like my AC green should not be on the cover. You should probably be on the cover. <laughs> um, but I've written two Laker books and, um, you know, I just, I just really thought sort of, I wrote it before Kobe died, but I really thought the Shaq Kobe dynamic was fascinating. Um, books sort of hang or to hang on big characters and, um, Shaq, Kobe, Phil, huge characters, Jerry West, a big character, Jerry Buss, a huge character. There's just a lot of things to write about. So um, it took me about two years. It was a nightmare. It was really hard. It was probably the hardest book I've ever written. But you know, you uh, books are hard. <laughs> yeah. Do you think in, and so Antonio or Neo, you know, brought up the fight and um, or the one fight that you write about? Mm -hmm. And I wonder, do you think people actually really knew? Like everyone knew that they didn't get along, Kobe and Shaq. Everyone knew that there was kind of like this tussle back and forth for ownership. You know, Kobe screaming, this is my team. Shaq is screaming, no, motherfucker, yeah. this is my team. And I say that as a quote from the book. I quote the That's book. The I quote the book. Okay, I all right. <laughs> Do you think like Laker fans really knew that it was that bad, that it had gotten physical? I think they'd forgotten a little bit. I think um, what happened is with time, about a year and a half ago, maybe Shaq and Kobe sat down and did a special on, uh, I think it was on Turner, where it's very cordial and very polite. And then um, when Kobe had his last game, Shaq showed up and there were hugs and blah, blah, blah. And, and I think um, things tend to, people tend to forget what it was like in the time period. Time tends to soothe things. So I think, um, I do think they forgot. I, I don't think they didn't know. I think they forgot. So, um, but it, it was really interesting. I mean, the one fight that you guys referenced, it happened in 2002 and I opened the book with it and it was a fight between uh, Kobe Bryant and um, some Maki Walker forward. And basically the Lakers used to do this game where they would, uh, they would each, during shoot around, they'd all take half court shots and whoever made it first uh, would get a hundred bucks from every player. And Kobe this day won. He's going around collecting money from every player and, and Samaki Walker forward with the team is like, I don't have money now. I'll pay you later. And he tries to get it later. And he's like, yo, I don't have your money. I'll get it to you later. Because not everyone walks around with a $100 bill in their pocket. And um, they're on a bus in Cleveland. And Kobe goes up to him and in the back of the bus. And he goes, yo, Maki, where's my money? <laughs> and Samaki Walker's like, I'll get your fucking money when, you, when I have it. And Kobe reaches back and pops him in the face. And Samaki Walker is six foot nine. Not, Samaki Walker is not a small guy. And he's from, you know, he's kind of a tough background. He's, he's not a, a wilting flower. And he stands up and he said he was sitting next to him with Jelani McCoy. And he goes to Jelani McCoy. And I, too, will be quoting from the book. He goes, did this motherfucker just hit me in the face? And <laughs> Jelani McCoy's like, yeah, he did. And Shaq is standing there. And Shaq goes, yo, just to uh, Smocky Walker. He goes, yo, you got to fuck this guy up. And uh, Smocky <laughs> Walker goes, 
stop the bus. Stop the fuck, Phil, stop the fucking bus. And Phil Jackson, all right, tells the bus drivers, all right, stop the bus. They're in the middle of Cleveland. Tamaki Walker's like, all right, Kobe, right now, let's go. Let's go. And Kobe won't get off the bus. And Smocky Walker's basically says, yeah, I didn't think so, bitch. And they get back on the bus. They get to the hotel. And Smocky Walker gets to his hotel room. And there's a message on his on his phone in the room. And it's, it's uh, Kobe Bryant crying, like sobbing. Yo, Maki, I don't know what got into me. I'm so sorry. I'm really sorry. Oh, my God, I can't believe this. And then later at the arena, again, Kobe Bryant, really sad, crying and, and apologizing. And it really, like, Smocky Walker, when he talked to me about the story, we met at a coffee shop in L.A., and when he told me the story, he wasn't using it to dog Kobe Bryant. This is why Kobe was still alive. He wasn't using it to dog Kobe Bryant. He was saying it to explain that this guy, there were a lot of complex, there are a lot of layers to this guy and a lot of complexities, and a lot of Kobe Bryant yep. was trying to cover up for what he wasn't and trying to take on these different personas and build up this wall, and he just was never really comfortable with himself in a lot of ways. And, you know, that was kind of smocky. Why he's trying to put up this tough guy front, but he really wasn't that tough. Yeah. I, so fast forward to another fight, if you will, another physical confrontation. 2003 pickup game. Yeah. Shaq smacks the bejesus out of Kobe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And and you have, um, I can't remember his first name, but Polonese is saying, he, you're oh, Kobe, you told him yeah. that if Polonese was holding Shaq back, like Shaq hit Kobe, and then people immediately tried to intervene. Polonese is holding Shaq back. He's screaming at other people. Somebody grabbed Kobe. Somebody shut him up or whatever. And he says in the book, if I had let him go, Shaq would have killed Kobe. Do you think yeah. Kobe? It was like, and people don't really think about this. Like we think, yeah, we know they didn't like one another. There was like some tensions back and forth. But even though I was covering games like yourself during this time, I never saw any physical confrontations. So this was like taking me back, and it was like, wow, they were really, they really did not like one another. So in that confrontation, Shaq said, "I'll get you traded." Yeah. Do you think if not for take take the rape allegations out of the picture? Because that that set a new tone for the organization. And you're, you're talking you you're think, referring to rape allegations against Kobe. Against Kobe. Kobe. Make sure our audience knows. So. Do you think Shaq had the juice to get Kobe traded? No, I do not. <laughs> um, I don't. I mean, you can maybe make the argument if this were in Kobe's first two seasons me and they got like whatever an offer of Scotty Pippen or something you know Pippen was always on the block maybe but not really I think you know I mean when Jerry West worked out I mean the whole Kobe coming to the Lakers thing was because Jerry West just thought this guy was a phenomenon which he and he was right um yeah, yeah. Nothing, I mean you know like the basically I mean to go real quick then 96 and Nets had the Kobe Bryant. It was a lock. We're going to take Kobe Bryant. And um, John Calipari was the. Uh, Do you ever deal with Cal? Yeah, I've, I've dealt with Cal. And if Greg Kelly is watching, he hates John Calipari. So yeah, yeah. I've dealt with Cal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, he was you no. Know, he was a he was a coach of the Nets, and they were set. They worked out Kobe four or five times and loved him, and they were set to take him. And John Nash was a GM. Kobe was a was the uh, uh, Calipari was a coach. They work them out. They love them. They call Kobe's parents before the draft. How do you feel about us taking your son? Oh, that'd be great. That'd be awesome. Kobe, though, has a deal with Adidas already. And Adidas does not want him playing in East Rutherford, New Jersey. They want him, you know, <laughs> big. And the Lakers work him out twice, love him. Uh, Arn Tellum is Kobe's agent. Arn Tellum and Jerry West are very close. We, we, they were, we'd love to get him to L.A. Everyone wants him in L.A. And... Um, Jerry West actually first calls the Nets and said, would you do a swap for the number eight pick? Nets are like, no way. Jerry Weston calls Charlotte, who has a 13th pick, and says, would you do this deal, Vlade, for the pick? Yes, if you can get, yes, we'll do that, sure. So basically, um, Kobe calls John Calipari and says, the, the day before the draft, and says, yeah, coach, I don't want to play with you guys. I want to get away from my parents. It's total bullshit. That's what he said. Calipari freaks out. He goes into the GM's office, John Nash. He's like, 
John, what, I don't know what we're going to do. John Nash is like, calm down. It's just a bluff. Uh, his agent, Kobe's agent, calls Calipari. Cal, here's the thing. Uh, he doesn't want to play for you. He'll probably, if you guys take him number eight, he's going to go to Italy for the year. Calipari runs into the GM's office. Oh, my God, what are we going to do? Cal, it's just a bluff. This is my favorite moment. I got this from Kendall Gill um, initially. Kerry oh, Kittle. Hi, I love Kendall Gill. Kerry Kittle is, <laughs> is uh, represented by David Falk, who is Michael Jordan's agent. And he really wants to play for the Nets. And he's, you know, he's an All-American out of Villanova. So David Falk calls um, John Calipari and says, listen, if Kerry Kittle is my guy, is there at number eight and you don't take him, I'm never going to have a free agent go to, you, go to you again. Oh, wow. And Calipari is like, oh, my God, what the hell is going on here? He runs into John Nash. John Nash is like, calm down. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Calipari is freaking out. The morning of the draft comes, and um, Calipari holds a meeting, and he says, with Nash and all the guys, he's like, here's what we're going to do. Kerry Kittles is there at number eight. We're taking Kittles. If he's not, we're taking Kobe Bryant. And John Nash had, I mean, uh, Calipari in his contract had final personnel say over his GM. So John Nash is horrified. Kerry Kittles is there at number eight. They take Kerry Kittles. As, uh, Kobe falls to Charlotte. And Jerry West says to Jerry Buss, the owner, as soon as this happens, he goes, I just got you the best player in this draft. I guarantee you. Um, so Jerry West was always huge on Kobe. And I just don't think even Shaq, I think they would have pushed as hard as possible to make it work out between the two of them, not trade him. Long-winded answer, but. Wow. Well, there's a question online from Jacqueline Robson. How did the rape accusations impact the team? That's a, first of all, it's the craziest season ever. It's 2003, 2004. You could have written, I could have written a book about this season. That was the year when Carl Malone and Gary Payton both signed as free agents. So they make this super team, right? Um, Shaq wants his contract renegotiated. The Lakers won't do it. The, there's a point during the preseason when Shaq is running down the court and Jerry Buss is sitting courtside and Shaq goes, pay me, pay me while doing this. Phil Jackson doesn't know whether he's going to be brought back. Kobe has basically decided, I'm going to go to the Clippers. Fuck the Lakers, I'm going to the Clippers. Um, and he's also flying back and forth to Eagle, Colorado. And at one point um, in the preseason, Kobe is an, is an Eagle, so he's not a training camp with, with the Lakers in Hawaii. And uh, a reporter asked Shaq, are you upset not having your whole team here? And Shaq goes, my whole team. Then there's another part, part. Say it again. Now we lost you for a second there, but Shaq said our whole team is here. Yeah, our whole team is here. Then there's another part. Um, they're flying back from training camp and Shaq and Kobe's not on the plane. This is one of my favorite moments. It's insane. I mean, it's gross, but it's insane. They're flying back to the mainland and Shaq used to carry like DJ equipment with him. And he basically starts doing this freestyle rap to 50 Cent song Pimp, but he calls it rape. So instead of P period, I period, M period, P, he calls it R period. You know, and I, I forgot the lyrics ever, but it was basically mocking Kobe Bryant about raping a girl. Oh I mean, God. it was really dark. It got really dark. Um, and they. Three ring circus. Three ring circus. Three ring circus. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, like. They didn't like Kobe at this point. Like, they did not like Kobe. Shaq couldn't stand Kobe. Most of the players couldn't stand Kobe. That doesn't mean Kobe's a bad guy when he died at 41, to be clear. But at this point in his life, he was a weird thing he did. He was flying back and forth to Eagle, Colorado for the trial, pre-trial. Now, this is, he went to Eagle initially to get his surgery without telling the Lakers. It was knee surgery. Didn't tell the Lakers. Um, had sex or, you know, or rape. We don't, you know, know for sure with this young woman. He did that. That was on him. He's flying back and forth to Eagle, Colorado, and he's furious with the Lakers that they're not sending him a nice, using a nice enough plane to fly him back and forth. And I kept thinking when I was reading that, man, you are lucky they're not putting you middle seat Delta to make you pay. You know, like, it's insane. So I just think the whole year was really negative, like really dark and negative. And um, I just think uh, a lot of that was due to Kobe and his behavior. It was just a dark year. It was a really dark year. Since you're on Kobe. And I think you you mentioned this in the book. It it exposed where Kobe um, sat with his teammates. Like this was a guy who you know got engaged without telling his teammates, as you mentioned in the book. Got engaged without telling his teammates. Got married without inviting any of his teammates. None of his teammates had been to his home. He didn't hang out with any of them. He barely ate with them. 
And so yeah. when this came about, when the charge, when the allegations came about that he had allegedly raped this young woman in the hotel room um, in Eagle, Colorado, the teammates were like, eh, you mentioned that Phil Jackson, when Arden Tellum called Phil Jackson, he was like, you're not going to believe this. Phil Jackson was like, no, I, I do believe it because there's a yeah. dark side to Kobe and he wasn't calling Kobe a rapist at all. But he said there's a dark side to Kobe that the public does not see, that only I as his coach and his teammates see. And I think that that was a very poignant point to make in the book because we often talk about these players as superstars, as the best ever, as goats or whatever, but we really don't get to see who they are when the lights go off, right. when the crowd... Well, you know what's really interesting? I used to... Um... A guy you know, I think. I used to room in New York City with a guy named Russ Bankson, who was the editor of Slam Magazine. And you know Russ, yeah. And um, I was a Lakers story with Russ, but go ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah, so I love Russ. And Russ and I went to Delaware together. We were, we were friends at Delaware. And um, he, um, I remember like he was the editor of Slam Magazine. And Slam was so cool and hip and dope and blah, 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 and all that stuff. And it was Iverson with the cornrows and the tats. And it was, you know, the merging of hip hop and culture and basketball. And whenever they would put Kobe on, and we talked about this at the time, it was forced because he wasn't, he wasn't really hip hop and he wasn't, you know, quote unquote street. And he didn't come from Newport News or from Coney Island. He was a guy from Italy and a guy from suburban Philadelphia, you know, and he just wasn't, it wasn't authentic. And I just think a lot of what he was trying to do and what a lot of Phil Jackson was talking about, uh, that Sally Nation talked about is sort of, he was always covering up. He was always covering up who he was and trying to be something he wasn't. And I just think when you grow up and you take Brandy to the prom and boys to men are your press conference going, going pro and you get a shoe deal at 17. I forgot it, all that stuff. I forgot he took Brandy to the prom. To Brandy to the prom. He didn't even know Brandy and he took her to the prom. Boys to men are his press conference. Um, he gets a shoe deal at 17. Like he was raised in a bubble. Like he was just raised in a bubble. He really was. And like, I think what you see with a lot, I mean, I always think of it sounds dumb. Being a kid and loving different strokes, and then seeing Emmanuel Lou, I mean, uh, Gary Coleman, I like Webster too. Gary Coleman's life path and like the <laughs> sadness, like being raised in a bubble, you know, or like Ricky Schroeder, like all these people mm -hmm. who are kids and they're raised to be this way and they don't grow up normal and they can't have a normal conversation and they struggle to relate. Like that was Kobe Bryant. And I even think the craziest part of that Eagle thing for me, reporting wise, was um, reading him. So he's approached by police officers, by two uh, Eagle, Colorado sheriffs, uh, uh, detectives outside the hotel where he's staying. And it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And I detail this in the book a lot. Any functioning human being would say, um, I need my attorney. I need my attorney. I can't say anything without my attorney. And basically, Kobe sits there and first he lies to them. They ask if he had sex with a woman. He says, no. Then they're like, Kobe, you know, we, we gave her a rape test. And he's like, well, okay, here's the thing. Maybe I did. Okay, I did. Then they're trying to get him to take him back to their his hotel room. They're like, look, Kobe, we don't want to do this in public. We want to do this in private. Let's go back to your room. Now, obviously, they're taking him back. You can see it. You see it all working like this. They're taking him back to the room because they want to be at the scene of the alleged crime. And he's like, okay, we'll do that. Why don't you tell your bodyguards? They don't have to worry about it. They're, tell them not to come. Okay, I'll do that. Like, for a guy who is so clutch in the moment, and I'm not trying, I swear to God, I'm not trying to like step on a person who died. Like I think Kobe at 41, it's tragic and horrible, 100%. It's remarkable though, a guy who performed in the clutch so well, in this moment, he's sitting there and he just crumbles apart. And I just think when you saw him in the real world a lot of times, same thing, he gets caught in that situation and he, he has his press conference with his wife, Vanessa, and he presents her with this ridiculous ring and it was like, it was the reaction of a adolescent. You know, it was the response of an adolescent. I'm gonna get her this big ring and I'm gonna present it to her in front of all these people. Oh, like, finally grown up yet. he yeah. just hadn't grown up. And he's actually, say that again? Four million dollar, four million dollar ring. Yeah, um, my wedding ring costs a hundred. I think not even a hundred, <laughs> I think it was 50 bucks. Yeah. Um, I lost my first one. Um, no, but the point is like, he just didn't know. He just didn't, like, he's almost, in a lot of ways, he's a tragic figure. 
right? In a lot of ways, he's a tragic figure yeah. because, because he didn't have the wherewithal and the development to handle things in a certain way. That doesn't mean, that doesn't excuse his behavior. I just think it's kind of sad. And a lot of times I kept thinking when I was reporting on Kobe, like the word I kept thinking was pathetic and not pathetic in like, he's an asshole or he's like, it's so pathetic. The effort, this, you so badly need to be this image that you can't allow yourself to be yourself or, or maybe you don't even know who you are. And there's something just sad about that, you know? So Kobe, of course, this, this year has been one of the worst years ever, but the death of Kobe started out this year when he died on, on January 26th. And your, your book actually starts out with an author's note about that. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk to like your personal relationship with Kobe and maybe some memories you've had with Kobe, if you have one? I, I don't actually. So I spent two years reporting on the book. Um, early on in the project, I was told by Kobe's, by someone who knows Kobe really well and works with Kobe that, um, your odds of getting him are almost zero. Uh, and then I did everything I could to try to get him, and my odds were clearly zero. And I think a part of that, a big part of that is um, just cut Eagle Colorado and him not wanting to discuss it. Uh, he also had a book come out around that time called The Mamba Mentality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't, and, and I always say, like I've said this for years, nobody owes it to an author to talk to them for a book. Like I, um, He's not making any money off of it. He doesn't get final editorial say, and it's going to cover a lot of turf that he's not going to want to have covered. So I always understand that. So you report the hell out of it is what you do. So I got tons of Shaq, tons of Phil, most of the teammates, went back to Kobe's early years, interviewed as many people as I can, researched the hell out of it. There was a really good book written uh, years ago called Showboat by Roland Lazenby about Kobe. You just research the best you can. But as far as personal Kobe experiences, I don't have many. Okay. Robbie, I yep, want to yep. get you I mean, in. I, I, want to, I want to get Rob in for a question. Robbie? I have a curiosity question. All right. Okay. Two basketball books, both Lakers. Are you a Lakers fan? And if not, <laughs> what's, what's your brand? Um, I'm not a Laker fan at all, actually. I don't hate them, but I um, I don't know. I uh, A lot of my fandom in sports was lost um, when I started working in Sports Illustrated, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah, that really happened, though. That really happened. Like, I would be covering – I remember one time – so I was mainly a baseball writer at SI. And I remember covering a game. And a friend of mine from college said, man, that's so cool. You got to cover your favorite team. And I was like, wait, I don't even – what do you mean? And I had to think about it. And he's like, oh, yeah, the team I rooted for when I was a kid. I just kind of lost it. So I wrote about the Lakers because they're a great organization to write about. The Bus family has been traditionally very good to deal with. Um, I live in Southern California. But am I a diehard, diehard, diehard Laker fan? By no means. It's just a subject for me. Any other basketball dynasties that you're planning on covering in the future? No, my next book is a book about a biography of Bo Jackson, uh, long ago. You know, mm -hmm. oh, no. I want to know that. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. yeah so that's been really like, fun. This is mysticism behind Bo Jackson, and, and I don't think people oh, really no. know. But what about a trilogy? Like at some point, let's say, for example, if LeBron and Antonio Davis go on to win next year and the following year and create a dynasty, would you consider the third installment to the Lakers, Jeff Perlman um, arsenal? For those that don't know, the Lakers did just win the NBA championship for this year. Hey, they did. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? I don't know. I don't think just being totally honest, like, um, like the NBA is just a different land than it used to be when we were sort of active and doing sports like, um, it's much more protective. It's much more guarded. I'll give you a quick story. I was, um, I was working. So the Lakers PR guy used to be a guy named John black and you know, John had his imperfections, but he was, I know, but when I was working on that showtime book, when I was working on that showtime book, he couldn't have been more helpful. Okay. I'm just saying, couldn't, who do you need? What do you need? Blah, 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 blah. This book, it was, they were a beast. The Lakers were hard. Jeannie Buss is still my favorite owner in sports. I've, I have nothing bad to say about her. She's the best, right? They changed PR departments. They did a major makeover. Mark Madsen was an assistant coach of the Lakers um, as I was reporting this. And I, the Lakers, after a lot of calling, and they said, oh, you can come up and talk to Mark after practice. Mark Madsen might be the nicest human being on the planet. He's just a truly decent guy. Former Laker forward. Just a great guy. And I go up. And we're talking practice is over. They're not on the road the next day. They don't even have a game that night. Nothing going on. 
I'm talking with Mark. He's great. I got, I'm about maybe 12 minutes in and I see um, the PR person behind me going like this, like this. And she wasn't doing it for any reason, except like in her mind, 12 minutes with Mark Madsen was enough. And it wasn't like this was LeBron or Anthony Davis or even whoever, Frank Vogel. It was freaking Mark Madsen. And the, the worst part is Mark Madsen was so happy to be talking. It was great. And I just think, I don't, I almost don't blame her because that's what the NBA has become in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. It's become a really tough place to cover. And they are so guarded and so protective. And so it's kind of like the, uh, you see when, when people are worried about what would happen when teams ran their own social media and, oh, would this mean the end of media? You know, what well, hasn't meant the end of it, but it means they can control their own media much better and their own messaging much better. But when it's crazy, it's like, it's Mark Madsen. It's like the third guy over on the assistant coach chain, you know, like he's, and he's happy to be talking and there's no threat. It's just great. That's when you're like, Ugh. so it's the idea of doing, going through it again with modern, more modern athletes. I don't know. All right. We've got about two Maybe. I think LeBron will ask another question. I think that's been like um, the case overall with sports. Like it's much harder now in 2020 to cover a story, to get interviews, oh, to yeah. get canned interviews and answers than when, when I first started in 98, when you were, you know, at the height of your career, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s at Sports Illustrated. Um, I, I can't even imagine me going into a locker room now and trying to get an interview without having to, you know, delve through all of the minutia, if you will. Um, but thinking well, about this okay. book, do you think, ha well, one, has either Shaq or Phil Jackson reached out to you or commented that you know of about this book? About three weeks ago? Right, so it's actually funny. All right, so the other day, the first Laker to actually say anything publicly was Mark Madsen, who was interviewed on a podcast. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you're always nervous. And he said, um, he raved about it. He was like, I learned stuff in that book I didn't even know, and I was there, which is the the best thing you can hear as a writer isn't like, I loved it or I hated it. It's I learned stuff I didn't know. You know, that's like the number one compliment to me, especially from people who are involved with the team. Um, Phil Jackson, it's funny. So Phil Jackson about a week and a half ago or two weeks ago was, um, so I spent eight hours with Phil Jackson in Montana. It was all, it was the best. It was really a joyful experience for me. And, um, you remember he was like, there was a day when he was, he was rumored to maybe be in consideration for the Clippers job. I don't know if you guys remember that, but that happened briefly, very briefly. He was rumored. And I get an email from him that day. And um, he wrote, Hey, what was the, uh, what was the name of the book you told me I should read the baseball book? What was that called again? And I was like a false spring. And I said, to, I think my wife, I was like, he's not taking the Clippers job because there's no way he'd be emailing me about a book on the day he was supposed to be taking the Clippers job. But like, you know, I sent, we sent books to all the Laker players. We sent book, you know, just for PR reasons, sent books to Turner. I haven't heard, I barely heard anything. I think most of these guys, being honest, probably don't read it. I asked Shaq about one of his books he wrote. He wrote a book. It was actually really good, good called uh, Shaq Talks Back with Mike Wise. And um, it was a really good book from the era. And I asked him about it. He's like, he's like, yeah, didn't read it. And I was like, yeah, you wrote it. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I, we have to, unfortunately, we're out of time. I did want to have one question that I just want your opinion on. So, of course, they would not have won. They wouldn't have done their 3P without Shaq and Kobe. But my question is, do you think they would have done it without seven-time champion Robert Ory? Ah, no, Robert Ory was usually the <laughs> Thank you. Usually important. It's always funny. You know how like there are always guys who it's like, we couldn't have won it without you. Like when the Lakers won that second round with Kobe and Adam Morrison was on the team and everyone was kind of making fun of Adam Morrison being on the bench and Kobe would be like, we couldn't have won it with Adam Morrison helping us out in practice. It's like, yeah, you could have. But, but <laughs> Robert Ory is actually one of those guys. Like, I mean, he was their clutch shooter. He was. I love Robert Ory. What I loved about Ory is he's like, um, he was asked once, how do you, how are you so unafraid to take big shots? And his reply was, if I make them, I make them. If I miss, I miss. And I just thought that actually perfectly sums up what clutch shooters all have in common, which is they're unafraid to miss because the, the repercussions of such doesn't really bother them that much, you know? All right. Um, I saw you had one last question. Go ahead, Lizzie. 
Dang, you made me forget what the question was. Oh, uh, do you think if if he had not died in that horrible accident in January of this year, do you think Kobe would have read this? I do, actually. I think he was more likely to than Shaq. Um, it's funny. It's not funny, actually. First of all, as I always say, I would, and I really sincerely, one million percent, obviously mean this, I would trade this book's existence for that to have never happened. You know, like I, to me, it was one of the most tragic. I mean, it was just, it's beyond tragic and all the people and his daughter. So, um, but I will say it's always awkward when you have a book come out and it's heavily critical of a certain, of a character or a person, um, him dying, you don't have that awkwardness. You know what I mean? Like it's not because he's not, but it's so freaking sad. Like it's so profoundly sad. Um, so sad. But he's not. It is sad. Oh. It is unbelievable. It is. It hangs over everything. And like, it hangs over. I've never written a book where I've never written a book, obviously, where the protagonist, main protagonist dies after the book came out. And it just the sadness of that and the tragedy of that hangs over this entire thing. Um, it just sucks. It's just a freaking worse. It's such a weird year that it feels like that was five years ago. But oh, it's it so freaking feel like it's been forever. I I when it, <laughs> I had to make sure that it happened this year. I had to actually double check. It's so weird. It's so weird. Yeah. All right. So. Well, I wanted you to get last words in, uh, Jeff. Um, anything you'd like to say? Tell people, um, you know, where to find Buy you, the et cetera. Buy the book. I want. I just want to thank Elizabeth Newman for teaching me everything I've ever known about sports and life, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and the Lakers. And uh, thank you guys for having me on. This has been really fun. You know, I'm a, I'm a huge, huge yeah. Elizabeth Newman fan. Probably the biggest. So it's a. I appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, thank you. We are too. Thank we are so much, Jeff. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All, right. All right. All right. We're ready. To thank you. Do well right. Do well right. I'm going to try. <laughs> I do my oh, best. No. All right. Again, the book right. is Three Ring Circus by Jeff Perlman. Make sure you check out jeffperlman.com or amazon.com. Amazon. Number one sports book on Amazon, people. Thank you again, Great Jeff, reading. for joining us. All right. Take care, guys. Yeah. Word. Wow. It's so funny that you have interviews that run long, but they don't feel long. It didn't feel long at all. I, I'm looking, no. I'm like, wow, it's already, you know, time has passed. <laughs> and <laughs> have a great conversation. Story, you know, from, because a lot of the things that Jeff talked about in the book, a lot of the events, a lot of the NBA championships that he talked about in the book, both he and I were there for. And so it was like going down memory lane. So he and I could have just gone story know, for story. Right? Remember? <laughs> yeah, I was trying to get Rob B in there. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> it, was just, it was just their personal anecdotes. He was there for a lot of it and behind the scenes. And what I really appreciated was what he shared about, you know, that's the best, the best thing you can hear from a writer is someone, hey, you know, I learned something about that. And I was there, I was part of this, but, I learned something that I didn't know about. I, and it's true. Like I love people watching gathering stories too. And I, I, yeah, I thought that that was just a, it was a pinnacle moment for him. I was happy for him. It's pretty cool. And I have to say, and this was a final, you know, thought or note for me. I remember January 26, 2020, like it was yesterday. It was a, a I, it just started school at Howard. So it was um, a Sunday that was off. I slept in that day. I didn't find out about Kobe until about maybe an hour and a half after the an announcement was released, if you will. And after the initial shock, and I was completely shocked. And I, I you know, grew up covering this kid. Wasn't necessarily a Kobe fan, but I understood his greatness. And I, I mean, I was speechless, which is very rare for me. And then after going over what happened and then understanding that not only Kobe died, but his 13 year old daughter, and then seven other people. The thing that bothered me the most is that his um, daughters, the children, but you know how I am with I, I immediately thought about Jeff because I knew the book was near its finish. Mm. And I was just mm. like, oh my, like, how does this affect this story, this, and, and that's the journalist in me talking, you know, and I don't mean to say that as someone who is insensitive or whatever, but as journalists, we, we do kind of gravitate towards the story. I thought about Jeff and I thought about, okay, well, what does this do for his book? Because he's been working on this for a very long time. 
I don't know how this is going to go over, but I mean, I, as someone who, again, was not a Kobe fan, um, covered him a lot, you know, been to games, whatever, but that, that moment in, on January 26th, like took me outside of myself for a bit. I just want to get a few um, comments and, in. Um, and I think that was the case for a lot of people in this country. From online, uh, before we move on. Uh, so Mike Winter says, these stories about old Kobe are why it took me so long to soften on him. Liz, uh, Liz and I must have talked about this stuff. Uh, Laurent Pearsall said, yeah, I remember Slam. Uh, and Jacqueline Robinson <laughs> says, I remember that Randy prom date. Uh, Winter says also, Kobe needed to be more like Grant Hill instead of trying to front like he was all hard. So I had to concentrate um, on the behavior. But he and Grant Hill had different things to prove, if you will. Like, there, there, there's a difference between Grant and Kobe. People respected Grant. Grant wasn't drafted as an 18-year-old who didn't go to college. Right. Kobe was graf- drafted out of high school. Um, and I, I think that led to a lot of his insecurities yep. because people constantly question his ability. Ron Pearsall said, Kobe, still the greatest. See you, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hey, hey Laron. <laughs> Let's get to 